Yeah, go ahead. So, are you interested? It's a it's 2008 Turbo. <laughs> it's Eleven right. miles. Eleven miles. And I would just like you to sign this. This, see, and this means that you will not be uh, enforcing the lemon laws on it. You could just then I get you the car, Professor Wolf. Thank you so much. <laughs> much appreciated. I just sold Professor Wolf a car. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Wait. Well, this that this is a, a very lawyerly one. signature. This looks like it's designed to not necessarily hold up in small claims court. <laughs> I too can play that game. Joining us now is Professor Richard Wolf. He is one of our guides and mentors. Of course, you can find his indispensable work at Democracy at Work on their Patreon page. Subscribe immediately to their YouTube channel as well. And of course, he also is a professor of economics at the New School. Uh, thank you. Professor Wolf, thank you so much for coming back. Glad to be here. It's always a pleasure. Is everybody uh, sounding good? First of all, I always have to just ask, we don't have to belabor it, but how's he doing? He's doing very well. He's doing better. <laughs> Do you feel more comfortable when he's talking about something that isn't exactly economics? No. Okay. He, 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 he ranges brilliantly across the different disciplines. Ooh, look at that. We'll cut that later to make it sound like you were saying that about me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's do a little edit, a little Trump-style edit on that, yes, baby. Yes, yes. Um, so, Professor Wolf, let's just start very big picture. China is a place that rightly fascinates a lot of people. It's uh, everything from the sort of, you know, exotifying racism of certain discourses. It's, it's a place that I guess has replaced like Japan of the 1980s in terms of fear mongering. But it's also, a, you know, it's not a place to romanticize or be naive about either. It's an incredibly powerful, you know, it's, it's a rising power. It calls itself a communist country and it seems to practice capitalism as aggressively as anybody on earth. Can you give us however way you want to do it the pathway to understanding what the economy is of the People's Republic of China. Sure. First, what they say. They refer to themselves as a socialism because, you know, most people in the socialist world did not call themselves communists. That's really more the, their enemies who called them that. It's true they were often governed by a communist party, but that word communist, when it was taken by a party, had to do with what their objectives were, not a claim about what existed. So in Russia, for, in Soviet Union, communism was envisioned as something they were moving toward and hoped someday to get to, but boy, it was a long way off and they did not claim they had arrived there. In fact, that would have been a kind of unacceptable claim that would have been debunked. The Chinese also say they are a special kind of socialism. The phrase they like is socialism with Chinese characteristics. Right. Okay, so what does it mean? For most of the 19th and 20th century, socialists around the world basically focused on two things that distinguish them from capitalism. One, whereas capitalism had private enterprise owned by citizens who had no relationship to the state, socialism, in contrast, was conceived of as the government acting on behalf of the people as a whole, coming in and taking over economic enterprises, factories, stores, offices. The idea was simple. If you have capitalism, a small percentage of the people own the means of production. They own the enterprises. Think of the, the individuals, the families, or even the shareholders. You know, 10% of shareholders in the United States own 85% of the shares. So you're talking a very small percentage of the people uh, own everything and ma make all the big decisions. You know, how to produce, where to produce, what to produce, and what to do with the profits. And so the socialist argument was, that's undemocratic. That's a small number of people who have all this economic power. They will in inevitably use it to control the politics so that the political system doesn't undo their domination within the economic system. And so the mass of people are effectively frozen out. 
And the socialists then identify themselves as the people that are breaking that situation apart, bringing the means of production back into the hands of everybody by having the government, presumably uh, representing everybody, take over. So the first idea of socialism was that the government comes in, takes over the land and the factories and so on, in order to run them for the benefit of everybody rather than, as in capitalism, for the owning minority. And the second big idea of socialism versus capitalism in both the 19th and 20th century had to do with markets, the the mechanism of distributing. First distributing the resources that go into production and then distributing the products that come out of production. And in capitalism, you celebrate the market. That is the institution that distributes. Um, In socialism, the argument was made, well, here again, that's fundamentally unjust. Why? Because a market allocates whatever is scarce to the people with the most money. And a socialist argued back then, which is one of the reasons why it was so popular, socialism, and grew so quickly, that this is fundamentally immoral. Can we correlate this with use value versus exchange value? In, in part, you okay. can. It, it, it resembles that kind of an argument. Okay. But I think a more simple way to put it is simply to say, look, if, uh, if milk is scarce, the cows got sick or some virus caught it, got it whatever. Right. If milk is scarce and a rich person has several cats as pets, and a poor person has several children, the market will allocate the scarce milk to the guy with the cats. And there was a profile in the New York Times, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but during Hurricane Sandy, they yeah. did a The water a piece. went up. Yeah, right. people well, charged for water and well, stuff. People charged, well, this that was serious. For sh- I, uh, This one I'm thinking of, though, is just an example of, you have people who, you know, this is right in the beginning. It took years for certain neighborhoods in Staten Island and Brooklyn and so on to get back yeah. on, right? Right. This was in the Upper West Side, and people's electricity had been out for a couple of days. And this woman was joking. She said, oh, yeah, we're, we're using Zinfandel in the toilets. <laughs> so, to flush great example. The right. They're yeah, flushing with the Zinfandel. Right. So, and it was so, a nice little adventure for them. So the yes. socialists had a field day yes, by saying, look, yes. m- markets are not what we want. Markets are ways of distributing that favor the people with the most money because they're the ones who can get what they want and other people can't. Right. And so the, the idea of socialism was you take the private means of production and socialize them, and you repress the market and substitute planning. In other words, you have a theoretically a democratic conversation what are the criteria for distributing so for example a child has higher priority than a pet for scarce milk or scarce diapers or whatever else there is and so socialism was take over the industry socialize it have the government run it and planning and that was the idea. Well, if that is your idea, then you can understand why after the Russian Revolution 1917, that's really kind of what they did. Not with the land. That they distributed to everybody, violating everything that socialists had always said, because they had to, for political reasons, to hold on to the Russian peasantry. The first thing Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky did was to distribute land to the peasants, who had been hungry for it for, for centuries. That's why, for example, when people say uh, socialism is against private property, I always look at them and say, do you have the faintest idea what you're talking about? The first thing the Soviets did was distribute the land, the most important resource they had, as the private property of individual peasants. But they did take over industry and they did plan their economy. The Chinese have basically done that too. The two big differences between China and Russia in terms of how they developed was that the Chinese decided early on that they were going to become an export economy. They were going to produce for the rest of the world something the Russians either didn't think to do or couldn't do because of their isolation. It's a little mixture of both. The Chinese were isolated at first too, but after Kissinger and things opened up, and also because the United States and Europe didn't 
behave in the same way, they began to see a road to economic development by basically offering to the West to produce everything the West had accumulated as consumer goods and capital goods cheaper and better. So then the 70s, there's the political opening when Nixon and Kissinger visit Mao. Right. Then there's some con con continuity with Carter. But then in the, in the 80s, Deng Xiaoping comes into power. And what, is he, what did he say? He said something like, I don't care what color the cat is as long as it catches mice. Right. And that was the and that signal. It's, and it's good to be rich. And it's good to be rich, he even said. That's right. So and that's it, why it's, it's funny. Deng Xiaoping belongs on the cover of that David Harvey book about neoliberalism, <laughs> even though he's a communist. It's, right. If you notice in the cover of that book, it's Thatcher and Reagan and I think Pinochet. And then there's a guy in a mouse suit. And you would think, why is he there? Yes. And then you read it, you're like, oh, he was actually at the center of it. So the Chinese said, we're going to be the, the place that produces everything that the West wants. Um, and so they entered onto a strategy, different from the Soviets. Partly they designed it, partly they had the option to do it. And, and it's very, very important in terms of the struggles now. They made the decision to be different from the Soviet Union because as part of getting in to the rest of the world, getting their stuff sold in the United States, for example, they wanted to demonstrate a kind of we'll meet you halfway. So what they did was they said, we will allow private enterprise. We will have the state with a very dominant position, the state-owned and state-operated enterprises, which remain to this day important in China, but we will allow private enterprises by the Chinese, and even more, we will allow joint enterprises in which the private Chinese can cut a deal with German or Japanese or American companies, and we will allow that as well. The glee in the West that they were going to be brought into this was fantastic. Western companies began to understand that this was a successful strategy. I mean that. The Western companies saw that the growth in wages, the growth in a market, the growth in access to this exploding market was unbelievably attractive, and they had to get in on it. And so they rushed to the Chinese, and here's what was done. A deal was struck over and over again, same deal. We want to be able to bring f production to China. We want to take advantage of the very poor wages, the low wages you pay. That's fantastic for us. We can close the factory in Cincinnati and open it in Shanghai, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Number two, we want access to your market. Why? Because already by the 1990s and into this century, the Chinese market was growing faster than the American. If you know anything about capitalism, it's not the size of a market, but the rate of growth. That is, that is crucial to, to, to planning for your future. So the American companies, for example, came in and they asked for two things, a cheap labor force and access. And the Chinese said, fine, we'll give you the cheap labor and we'll give you the access. You've got to give us your technology hmm. and you've got to give us help in getting access to your market so we can sell this stuff, which is in your interest because you're producing in China stuff you want to sell in the United States too, so we'll do that together. That's when the marriage, because that's really what it is, between China and Walmart develops. The, the two of them need each other, have for 35 years. There would be no Walmart of the sort we take for granted without the Chinese and vice versa, because what Walmart did is give the Chinese an instant distribution network. Anything the Chinese could produce, Walmart would bring into every village and town, every suburban mall, everywhere. Fantastic right. deal. But that's why when you hear today, the Chinese are stealing our technology, that is nonsense. That's pure ideological bashing of China. A deal was struck. They got the technology, which they demanded, in exchange for the cheap labor and the access. And that was a deal that nobody held a gun to anybody's head. The American company that didn't want to share technology walks away. But it didn't want to because it was willing to parlay that technology and to claim now, oh, they forced us is is really it's a crock and it's a silly kind of crock anyway so I finish just two oh yeah, yeah finish finish please. finish your story Sorry. what the chinese did is this mixture of private and state enterprise 
uh, controlled by a communist party in power and holding on to that power, deals to be made both by the state enterprises and by the private enterprises with foreigners for goodwill, for access to markets abroad, for the whole export focus, to work all of that out and at the same time have a, a kind of government control. So, for example, wages rose. I mean, the Chinese already knew long before Trump that to make an economic development program as dependent on exports as they had made it was a wonderful way to industrialize quickly. That's why China is so powerful. But it's also very, very dangerous because if anything were to happen to that export market, you're done. You, and that's out of your control. That depends on what the Europeans will buy from China, what the Americans will buy. Their first lesson, their shock, was the collapse of 2008 and 9, when suddenly the export market collapsed for China because the West was going through a crisis, couldn't buy what it had bought before, and that was a real big wake-up call. And they made the decision, again, this is before Trump, to refocus their economy away from exports and build up their internal market. Right. And the only way to do that is to raise wages, which is why the wages in China have gone up so dramatically, many times faster than what happened to wages here in the United States. The comparison, I mean, there is no comparison. Here, the wages have basically stagnated for 30 years. In China, they're about four to five times in real terms today what they were 30 years ago. So it, it, it's as different as night and day. And so... This was successful. It's not a question of liking the Chinese model or approving what they do with civil liberty. It, that's another matter, an important one. But if you're going to be talking about economics, the Chinese have developed their economy, an economy of one, almost one and a half billion people. One of the poorest places on this planet is now the second economic power, and within a decade, will likely overtake the United States in sheer output. This is an unbelievable achievement. It is a greater, more rapid economic development than any capitalist country has achieved by a lot. This year, for example, the, 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 the Western press crows Chinese economic growth is only 6.2%. Mm. Yeah, the United States is two percent. So, and that's been the ratio, two to three to one, which is why the gap is narrowing and they're catching up. Because in a bad year, they grow f two to three times faster than we do in this country, and they've been doing that a long time. And I think the bottom line of all of what you're seeing now is a kind of wake-up anxiety on the part of Mr. Trump and those sectors of the American economy he represents, or at least that to support him, who are realizing that this is now a whole new game, that they waited, they, they may have been able to smash China earlier if they had, you know, followed up the Korean War with an attack on China, which some wanted to do, but by now, they can't. It's too late. And that the frustration and rage and upset, it's a little bit like the British having to face that their old little colony, the United States, outmaneuvered them, outranked them, and now it's the dog being wagged by well, what was the I think tail. They still can't deal with Get that, too, it. if you look at their Brexit fantasies, that right. somehow they're going to muscle their way into some global market dominance. You've just watched a Michael Brooks show video, and you can watch all of our full main live shows every Tuesday night at around 7 p.m. Eastern time and subscribe to get all of the clips you want. We're covering the globe. We're focusing on international relations, the intellectual dark web. We're having fun. We're doing deep dives with a lot of amazing guests. Of course, become a patron for the whole thing at patreon.com slash TMBS or subscribe to this YouTube channel and help us keep growing and get that content out there. Subscribe below.